we were singing, I believe it was in the first songs we sang about I'm free to dance. You know, the freedom that we have in God. And many times we, I think that we minimize that. That we don't really comprehend the freedom that we've received in Christ. And what we've received through Christ and His sacrifice. You know, I think we focus on, yes, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven for my sins. But I think so much more has been done through the blood and body of Jesus Christ. Alright, if everybody's there, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. It says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we have made Him out to be a liar, and His word has no place in our lives. Father, I just ask as I bring forth this word that it will be your Holy Spirit that leads us and teaches us, Lord. That your word will penetrate our hearts and bear fruit in our lives, Lord. And that we may go forth from here and bear fruit in the lives of others. I thank you for all you're doing in Jesus' name. You know, I think some would say that this verse is talking to unbelievers. If we claim we are without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. However... I don't believe that it is. I believe it's talking to the body of Christ. As in the book of James, James chapter 5, he tells us to confess our sins one to another and pray for another that we may be healed. You know, it's an ongoing process. You know, many times in the body we focus on the forgiveness that we've gained through Christ. And we have that. You know, He's forgiven all our transgressions. He paid the price for us. For all the sins, no matter how great they are. You know, I've said many times, I've used this example, and uh, it always uh, amazes me. But the three main writers of the Bible, Moses, David, and Paul, who was Saul, and all three of them shared the same sin, which was murder. Now think about that. In our society, would we lift up murderers and then listen to what they're proclaiming? Right? But God has lifted them up. And if you, if you look in the Word, the Word of God, one of the things that convinces me that it is the spoken Word of God is because men, by their own nature, glorify themselves. In other words, they don't put forth their sin. But if you look throughout the Bible, it's men, and it's, their sin is revealed. One of the things I was talking about in, in uh, Sunday school today, I mentioned about Noah. It talks about Noah got drunk with wine and his daughter slept with him. Now, who's going to write that down for all history to see? But the point is, God is not trying to glorify man. All right? Man's sins are clearly revealed in the Word of God. All right? So, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But it goes on from there and it says to purify us from all unrighteousness. Not only to forgive us our sins, but to purify us. Purity is something that is one substance, right? Pure snow has nothing else in it. Pure water is what we want to drink, right? You don't want to drink chlorine or you don't want it to have sulfur in it or iron. You don't want those heavy metals in it, right? You want it to be pure, right? And God wants us to be pure, all right? And as this word says, he says he's going to purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, the cornerstone of our faith is that Christ's sacrifice paid the price and that we have forgiveness through that. But then then what? After forgiveness, then what? Do we sin anymore? Right? Do we continue in sin? Or is sin over? Well, even Paul, in Romans 7, 19, you don't have to turn there, but Paul said, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do, that is what I keep on doing. That was Paul's battle. He's saying in his flesh, he wants to do good, but he keeps doing things he doesn't want to do. How many of us have been there? I know I have. You know, the Lord has spoken something to me and I went the other way. You know, when, when God is speaking something to you and you do something other than that, that's sin. When we don't obey God, it's sin. Right? We need obedience. Um, so what then? You know, after salvation, there's forgiveness. What happens after salvation? Do we just keep sinning and asking God for forgiveness? 
Is that what it's about? Paul posed a similar question in Romans. This is Romans 6, chapter 1. He says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And even more bluntly, in Hebrews 10, 26, he says, For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled under the foot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace. So what he's saying here is, if those, the Israelites, if they sinned and two or three people said, look, I saw him, I saw what he did, they would kill him. They would stone him. And he's using that as an example. And what he's saying is, if you're trampling on God's grace how much more judgment is going to be reserved for you? Alright? What's the expectation there? In Romans 6, Paul tells us that we have been set free from sin. But my question is, have we? Have we been set free from sin? Yeah, absolutely, Christ has paid the price, but are we walking in that freedom? As that song says, I will walk in that freedom. I will walk in that liberty. Are we walking in it? Are we walking in Christ's freedom? Are we still in bondage to sin? Is sin still controlling our lives and our moment and our movements and in our actions? You know, one of the things when I when I uh, was preparing this message that I wanted to impart is that freedom because there's so much more than just forgiveness. Forgiveness is the beginning. All right, if If Christ left us out there after He forgave us, we would still be like a drowning man. We'd be out there dying and perishing. Right? There's so much more than that. He forgave us. Now He wants to sanctify us. He wants to purify us. Alright? He wants us to go on from there. No, but I think one of the one of the traps that we fall into is first off, we get saved and then we think, well, I can't sin anymore can appear at least to sin, right? I've got to be upright in front of people. People can't see what's going on in, in my life. But as I said before in James chapter 5, it says, if you sin, to confess your sins one to another and pray for each other, right? Do you see that happening in the church, right? Are we going to our brother and saying, look, I'm struggling with something. I'm really having a hard time. I keep falling in this area. Or are we hiding it? I just went to a, a men's conference and they were putting out statistics, and I, I don't remember all of them, but they were, they were high, very high as far as men in the church that were involved in pornography. And the numbers were staggering, but they were also embarrassing. Right? Why is it? Right? Why are we engrossed in sin? You know, and I think that one of the things that I also want to impress is that the enemy uses this. Right? Because... After we receive forgiveness, if He can get us to go back and to crawl in the same pit that we came out of, right? we'll feel defeated. And when we feel defeated, we're not going to share the love of Christ. right? You're not going to tell somebody else about the freedom that you have in Christ if you don't feel free. right? If you feel like you're wrapped up in bondage, right? the enemies won the battle that he wants to win. He lost your soul, but you know what he really wants to do is to keep your mouth shut. Right? He doesn't want you sharing Christ's love with other people. So he wants you defeated. All right? He wants to beat you down. You know, it just came to my mind. I was thinking about, about uh, David and Goliath. Right? And Goliath was standing there at the line and he was yelling and he was calling all the Israelites dogs. Right? And saying, come out and fight me! And this guy's like nine feet tall, right? And he's got a spearhead that weighs 15 pounds. And he's calling him, saying, come out and fight me! Come out and fight me! You know what? What amazes me is all these Israelites were standing out there like this. 
They were defeated, right? They were defeated before they ever picked up their sword. They were in bondage, but not David, right? Who God says is a man after my own heart. He comes out, he's just not much more than a boy, a shepherd, right? And he comes out and he says, who is this who's mocking God's people? And he stands up against him. He goes forth proclaiming God's word and God's goodness, right? He wasn't defeated. But the enemy would have us believe what Goliath says, that we are defeated, all right? That we're still bound in our sins. And as long as we feel that way, that we're still bound in our sins, we're not going to proclaim God's goodness. Um, So what is the answer? How do we defeat sin in our lives? But in the question, there lies the problem. And the question was, how do we defeat sin in our lives? You know, before Christ, we could not stop sinning. Think about it. You couldn't stop doing the things that you were doing. I know I couldn't, right? I I smoked and I tried to quit smoking many times and I couldn't do it. I would keep going back to it. I drank and I keep drink, kept drinking. I had people, they put me in programs so I could stop drinking, but I wouldn't stop drinking. I kept doing it. I was defeated. I was in bondage to sin. But before Christ, right, we were defeated, right? The answer is in Christ. It's not about us. It's not our defeat of sin, right? It's going back to Christ. We must return to Christ. That's where the victory is. You know, we, we proclaim over and over and over again that Christ's death furnished the payment for our forgiveness of sins, right? But what about the payment for our deliverance from sins, right? He doesn't not only want to forgive us, He wants to take us out of that bondage to remove that sin from our lives, right? If you're, I, I want to say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to point anything out. But if you're in bondage to something in your life, that's not what God wants. Absolutely not what God wants for your life. And I don't care what it is. You may say it's not a sin, but if you're dependent on that thing, that's not what God wants because He wants us what? Dependent on Him. Right? It's all about Him. It's all about Him. Right? So, you know, there's freedom, but the freedom is in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, we know that Christ is returning for a church. And the church that He's returning for is one without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. You know, and I think many times we we kind of gloss over this. And we paint a picture that what Christ is returning to is that He's kind of like blinded to our sin. In other words... The church hasn't stopped sinning. There's still a bunch of miserable sinners, no better than the world, right? But Christ is just ignoring it, right? He's just blocked it out. And I don't think that's true. Let's turn to Revelations chapter 3. Revelations chapter 3, and we're going to be in verses 14 through 21. My question was, does Christ really see the church that way? Does He really see us as perfect even though we're not? So Revelations chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. It says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. I think when you look at this and what God is proclaiming about, this is a church, this is believers. He's not speaking to unbelievers. This isn't to the world. He's talking about the church, and he's talking about them, and he's saying, look, you think you're rich, you think you're wealthy, you think you got it all together, you think you're sinless, but the reality is you're naked, you're miserable, you can't see, right? You're blind. That's how he sees us. He's looking at us and saying that. You know, but what is this counsel, right? What does he tell them to do? Come to me, right? Come to me, and what will I do? I'll give you gold. I will give you white garments. I will give you eye salve to heal your eyes. Right? He's counseling us that after salvation, we must continue to come to Him so He may transform us, that He may change us. All right? It's not about us. I think so many times we fall into that trap about trying to be good. Right? I've got to be this way. I've got to present myself this way. I can't do this. I can't, you know. And you know, that's just a trap. It's really just a trap because we're relying on our own strength. And as the scripture says, pride cometh before the fall. If I'm relying on my own strength, it's nothing but pride. And what the end result of that's going to be is I'm going to fall on my face. I'm not going to be able to do it on my own. Right? When we come to Christ in salvation, we're on our knees, we're begging for forgiveness, right? We need to have that same heart. That same heart. Look, I've stumbled, I've fallen. Lord, change this about me. Right? As David said, create in me a clean heart. Right? Renew a right spirit within me. That was David's cry. He knew his sin. He confessed it to the Lord, but he also went further than that, was asking the Lord to change his heart. Right? It's God's grace. You know, and my, my, my contention here is that payment's made. Christ already made the payment. It wasn't just for forgiveness. It was for deliverance. All right? It was for freedom from sin. All right? Not just the consequence of sin, but freedom from sin. All right? So we must go further than that. <clears throat> when I was a... When I was a, a new Christian, I had uh, been saved about six months. And I, I had told you that I smoked. I smoked cigarettes. I smoked a couple packs of cigarettes a day. And I chewed a can of uh, chewing tobacco every day. All right? That was an everyday thing for me. I was in bondage. That was a bondage. You can say, well, you're not going to go to hell for that. But I was in bondage. I couldn't stop doing it. All right? And what would the end result be? Maybe I won't die from it, but I bet you I'm going to be miserable in this life if I continue to do that. All right? Christ doesn't want that for us. He's given us freedom. And I was a new Christian and I didn't know any better, so I believed that Christ was going to deliver me for it, from it. So I started praying every day. God, deliver me from this. Deliver me from this. And you know what happened? Six months later, I was no longer a smoker. I didn't quit. He just took it from me. I had no desire. I never returned to it. I didn't want it. All right? He removed me. I woke up one day and I was no longer a smoker. It was over. The bondage was done. Why? Because he paid the price, right? And he's calling us to turn to him. <clears throat> I want to uh, go back to Revelation for a second and reread something. Excuse me for a second. Verse 18. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. You know, that's his counsel to us. It's not just to you know, confess the sin, be forgiven for the sin. It's for, to go to him and have him change that part of our life. Right? That He will do it. That He will remove the impurities in our life. You know, it also talks about in this, in Revelation, about God's discipline. And we know also in um, Hebrews chapter 12, right? The scripture says that God disciplines every son that's His. Every son that He loves. 
right? That that's part of correction, right? If you have a child and your child continues to do something that would hurt them or jeopardize their life and you don't correct them, you don't discipline them, you don't love them, right? You don't. I, I saw something on the news recently about this woman and uh, a police officer was driving down the street and, and uh, there were little kids, I'm talking like two or three year olds, that were playing in the street. And uh, so he stopped and, um, <laughs> and there were other kids, two little kids that were inside the car. They were three and four years old, all right? And they had the keys to the car and they were trying to start the car. All right. Now the police officer starts looking around for the parents, which are nowhere to be found, and he finds the house and he beats on the door and the, the woman's in there and the mother and she's in the shower. And uh, he says, you know, he tell, explains to her what's going on and she says, oh, it was only a couple of minutes. Now he had been looking for her for a half an hour at this point. All right. Does she love those children? They're out playing in the street. They have her car keys. They could be killed at any moment, right? Where's correction? Now, God uses us as an example and saying that He will discipline us, that He brings correction in our life. Why? Because He loves us. Because He's trying to get us to turn back from our sin. Sometimes it takes a two-by-four upside the head, right? He's going to whack you upside the head and He's going to say, hey, look, that's not the direction I want you to go in. It'll destroy you. Right? What's the end result of this? Where will you be? <clears throat> oh, you know, in, in talking about sin, there's a reference, and it's in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11. And it's God's perception of a person that returns to their sin. And what he says, it's like a dog returning to its vomit. And what it means is the dog goes back and eats what it threw up. It's disgusting, isn't it? But what God is saying is, that's how I see you when you go back to that same pit that I delivered you from. Why are you going back there? Right? Why are you returning to your sin? Why is your desire for that thing? It's amazing. And uh, when I look at when uh, Moses and he's taking the children of Israel out and they're saying, we want to go back to Egypt. We're going to die out here. Weren't there graves in Egypt? Right? We had food there and all they do is complain. They want to return to their bondage. They were slaves there. They were slaves in Egypt. Why would we want to return to being slaves? Why do we want to be servants of sin? Right? God doesn't want that for us. When He forgave us, it wasn't just to forgive us and say, hey, keep going, keep doing what you were doing, right? The point was, He wanted to deliver us from that, freedom from that. <clears throat> Let's turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and uh, I'm going to start in verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her, that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word, that He might present to Himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and blameless. Christ died for us. He loved us so much that He laid down His life for us. Right? Why would He want us to return to sin? He doesn't. What is He saying about the church? He wants to sanctify us. He wants us to go on from there. And then He wants to present Himself, the church, in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Now, <clears throat> one of the problems today, you know, we, we hear, well, you're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. You know what? 
Christ is perfect. And if Christ is in you, He can perfect you. He can change you. He can purify you. No, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. But Christ can be perfect through us. Alright? You know, what does it say in this word? It says, verse 26, He might sanctify her, her being the church, by the cleansing, by the washing of the water with the word. So, we know that Christ is the word, but in this context, it's Christ talking, saying He's going to wash the church with the word. Right? So, He is the living word, He's the word, but this is also the word. So what does that mean? It means that Christ will speak to us through the Holy Spirit, through the Word. That's part of the reason why it's so important that we're in the Scripture. Not just reading the Scripture, but meditating the Scripture. Because what happens as the Holy Spirit reads the Scripture, it's like food for your soul. And God will begin to purify you through that process, the washing of the Word. He'll begin to change areas of your life. There are areas of my life that God was not pleased with. He was displeased with. Now, somebody else might look at that area and say, there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. You're not sinning in any way. But God didn't like what I was doing. All right, He was displeased with it. It was taking me in a direction other than what He wanted. And when I read the Word, He began to speak to me and He began to change that area of my life. All right? Now, <clears throat> there is a prerequisite and that is the one that we hear God and that we're obedient to that, right? Because you can read the Word of God all day long, but you have to obey the Word of God when He speaks it to you, right? It's just like a child. We, if you've raised children, you know sometimes they say they'll do something, but then they don't, right? They say they're going to be, be obedient, but then they don't. Go clean your room. Come back half an hour later, the room's still dirty, and they're playing with their toys, right? They weren't obedient. What do we need? We need to be obedient. God speaks We listen, we allow Him to change us, right? And when we do that, then He's going to do it so much more. He's going to be able to transform us. He's going to be working through us, right? There's an obedience. One of the reasons I I had said that about how God had delivered me from smoking, well, one of the reasons I believed that was because He had delivered me from alcohol. I couldn't stop drinking, and He took that from me. Right? He removed that from me, and I was no longer an alcoholic. I haven't drank in 29 years. I haven't touched a drop of alcohol. Right? That's God's grace. But I knew that. I was obedient, and I allowed Him in that area of my life. And then I said, okay, well, why don't you take this area of my life? What is beyond Christ? In other words, what is Christ incapable of removing from your life? Is there anything? Right? Didn't His price pay for everything? Can He not sanctify the body of Christ and remove the imperfections in us? He's coming back for that church, the one without spot or wrinkle, right? Well, how is that? It's the ones that are allowing that to transpire. Are we going to be obedient to Him and say, okay, remove these imperfections from me? Or are we going to deny that we have sin? Are we going to pretend that there's no sin in our lives Right? And therefore, what we do is actually kind of spit on what Christ did. All right? When we deny that we have sin and don't allow Him to change our lives. <clears throat> you know, I've mentioned this before and I want to focus on this again for a second because this is one of the primary tools I said about being in the Word. But I've talked about and I taught before on um, you know, the, uh, the armor of God. You know, we have many different pieces of armor. Helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, feet shod for the preparation of the gospel. You know, all of the armor of God is defensive except for one. And that's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, what does that mean? What what is my point? My point is, all defensive armor is to defend against the blows from an enemy. Right? You put up the shield to defend. But what's the point of a sword? You attack. You attack the enemy with a sword. Alright? So, 
the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, is a sword in our hands. And we need to be attacking the enemy with it. Now what does that mean? That means we don't sit back and wait for him to attack us. We pick up our sword and we begin to use it. Okay? When I, when I, um, when I came to the Lord, I, was, uh, I had a lot of fears. All right? To the point I was actually almost paranoid. All right? I had a lot of fears. I was scared of many different things. And um, I used the sword. Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Now what do I mean I used it? I began to proclaim that. I began to say, yes, Lord, you're with me. Right? And you know what happened? Those fears left me. All right? Because I beat back the enemy with the sword. All right? The enemy's trying to come against you. And the attack that may be in your life may be entirely different than the attack that's in my life. You need to be in the Word. You need to pick up the sword and start beating him back. Stop waiting him for to attack you. Go on the offensive. Start looking for the answer. All right? It's there. It's there. Christ will deliver you. Now let's. I'm going to. I'm going to close with this. Let's turn to um, Hebrews chapter three. Hebrews chapter three, and we're going to begin in verse twelve. When everybody's there. Well, I wrote down the wrong one, I think, here. But um, Give me one second here. It's actually Hebrews chapter 4. Sorry about that. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, For the word of God is living and active, and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him whom we have to do. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession... For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now, I challenged you, and I'm going to challenge you again, to use the sword, to meditate on the Word. Now, if this... If what I'm saying to you today is striking home, in other words, there's areas in your life that you don't have the victory, here's a scripture for you to meditate on, right? To take and use against the enemy because it's all here, right? The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. So what that's saying is he can cleave right through that. He can remove that, right? He can take that from you. You know, they say... They say that uh, cigarettes are actually one of the most addictive substances known to man. It's actually more addictive than heroin. All right? But God removed that from me in a second. Right? That's God. That's the power of Christ. He can remove that from your life through the Word. That's the sword coming down in our heart. You know, and looking in verse 14, he says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Now think about that. It says Christ was tempted in all things as we are. Now think about this. Did anybody ever offer you the whole world? In other words, you can have it all. 
You can be the supreme dictator over all the world if you just bow down to this person. Well, Christ suffered that. Then he came to him and said, just bow down before me and I'll put you over everything because the enemy had that authority at the time. He was over the world, right? So Christ was tempted way beyond what we're tempted. Sometimes we can't resist the smallest little thing, all right? But he was tempted in all those things. And he can sympathize with us. What that means is, not that he's going to cry, that he's sorry for us, but that he can understand what we're going through and he knows what we need in our time of weakness. Right? So what do we need to do? We need to draw near to him. We need to clamor for him. We need to cry out to him. Lord, change this in my life. Give me the grace that I need to overcome this thing in my life. You know, I need freedom. I need to walk in your victory. Right? I need to proclaim your victory. That's where the church should really be because Christ paid the price. He already did it. All right? Just like we know we have forgiveness, right? Through his sacrifice. He's already done this. All right? There's freedom from that. But we need to, we need to cry out. You know, we were talking about authority. John was mentioning authority earlier. We have this authority. We have the authority to pick up the Word of God and go attack the enemy, right? And He has no stronghold in our life that we don't allow to be there, right? When the enemy has victory in our life, it's because we're allowing the enemy to have victory in our life. Christ already won the battle. It's done. He paid the price and He gave us every tool we needed to defeat the enemy. So, As in verse 16, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, I'm thinking about about the the tabernacle and and the Holy of Holies and the the high priest would go in once a year. And he would go into the Holy of Holies. And if there was sin, if he was not sanctified, he would die, Right? He would be struck down right then. Now they literally, they tied a rope to him when he would go in. Because they couldn't go in and get him. Because you know what would happen if they went in? They would die. So they had a rope. And they also put bells on his clothes. And the bells were, if the bells stopped jingling, well then they thought, well, he was sinning and he's dead now. So we've got to pull him out by the rope. Now, what's my point is, what kind of assurance would he have of going in there? I can't even imagine what I would be like thinking, I've got to go in. I gotta go into the Holy of Holies. Am I forgiven? But what is he saying here? We can draw near with confidence. We can go boldly to Christ, right? We can run into the Holy of Holies and say, God, forgive me. Change me. We don't have to worry about the bells on our clothes or whether we're sanctified. We can draw near to Him and let Him do it, right? Run to Him with confidence. In conclusion, <clears throat> the struggle, the struggle with sin. that we need to overcome this. We need victory, right? Two things. We need to boldly go to Christ and get the victory. We need to continue to do that. If you don't have the victory, you should be crying out daily for that victory. I should not be in bondage to this thing. Help me to overcome that. And the Word. Pick up your sword. Use it against the enemy, Right? Don't be foolish enough not to be in the Word. Right? You're giving Him the victory. You're laying down. I'm going to put the sword down like the Israelites do. They just stood there. One man standing there. Why didn't three of them run up there and chop his head off? Three of them could have defeated him. If one couldn't, right? They just laid their swords down. Are we going to do that? Are we going to just lay them down and let the enemy have the victory in our lives? Right? Pick it up. Strike the enemy. Go forth. Proclaim boldly what Christ has spoken. You know, it's all about Him. It's all about Him. It's all about Jesus. And what I mean by that, and what I want to emphasize about that, it's not about us. It's not about us working out our salvation in that sense. It's about us going to Him and allowing Him to work through us. When we humble ourselves, He will lift us up. Right? You know, think about Peter who says, 
All of these may leave you or forsake you, but I'll never do it. I'll never deny you. He speaks forth in his pride. He was a believer. He was a believer, but what happened, right? He denies Christ, and he starts cursing at some woman and saying, I never knew this person. Can you imagine? This is a believer, right? Why? Because it was about Peter. It wasn't about Christ. He wasn't relying on God's grace. He was relying on his own strength. And so many times that's what we're doing as Christians. We're relying on our own strength to overcome the battle. It's ridiculous. I could not obtain forgiveness for my own sins. How am I going to obtain victory over my sins? Right? I need to go to God and cry out for His grace to remove those things in my life and change my life, and He can purify me. And when He comes back for that church without spot and blemish, right? what He's going to see is actually a reflection of Him because it's Him working through the church. Right? If He comes back and He sees me, honestly, I think I'm going to be in trouble. All right? I don't want Him to see me because me is not a pretty picture. All right? It's Christ through us. I want to. I'm going to close there, but I want to. I want to take a moment, and, and I just want to pray. But I want to. I want to ask that if this is a struggle for you, if this is a struggle for you, that you will reach out. That you will reach out. All right. You know, if you're in bondage, there's no desire in God for you to be there. He wants freedom in your life. He absolutely wants freedom in your life. He wants you to walk in that victory. You know? And I want to challenge you to reach out. As it says in James, you know, confess your sins one to another and pray for another that you may be healed. Well, what is that saying? A lot of the problems in our life are a result of our unconfessed sin. We're walking in our own pride. So I want to challenge you. I'm going to, I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask everybody just to close your eyes. Bow your heads and close your eyes. And my, my prayer is, if you're struggling with this, if there's areas of your life that you have not gotten the victory, just, just raise your hand. Just, just raise your hand. Thank you. And I just, I'm going to pray, Lord. I'm going to pray that you deliver these people, Lord, that they will confess to you whatever it is they're struggling with. It doesn't matter, Lord. You can overcome anything. There is no bondage that we have not already obtained the victory, Lord. And I just ask that you remove these things from their lives, Lord. Also, give them a boldness to go boldly before you, drawing near to you and obtaining your grace. I just thank you for what you're doing, Lord. And I thank you for this word that you spoke to my heart. I thank you for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name I pray. Those of you that, that raised your hand, or if you didn't raise your hand, I want to put forth one more thing that I think I asked a question about when I talked about James chapter 5 about confessing your sins one to another. You know, I think so many times that we're, we're walking in our pride and because of our pride we think, oh, I can't, be stumbling. I can't be struggling. I can't have this weakness, right? And because of that, we give the victory to the enemy, right? We need to confess it. We need to go to somebody and talk to them and ask for prayer. Humble ourselves, right? And what I want to challenge you is to find somebody who you can do that with. If it's Pastor Kevin or if it's John or if it's me, whoever it is. It doesn't even have to be one of us. It can be another member of the congregation. But share the truth with them and ask them to pray with you, right? And if they're a believer, all right, if they're a brother or sister in Christ, they're going to love you and they're going to lift you up in prayer, right? If they're not, they're going to sit back and judge you and move away from them. But find somebody that you can do that with, right? Confide in each other, right? Love each other and stop having the pretense that we're not struggling, that there's no problems, that everything is good, right? By doing that, we give the victory over the enemy. We might as well walk out of here and leave the church now, you know? And I thank you. Thank you. God bless and have a good day. And well, we have a dinner tonight, so hope to see you all tonight.